you don't purposely go out and think you're going to give your life to a bunch of animals. That's not really my plan. That's not what happened. And I've always dealt with animals in a very intuitive way, but I never knew what it was and why. Aloha, my name is Ann Goody. I'm the executive director of the Three Ring Ranch, which is the exotic animal sanctuary in Kailua, Kona. And we've been here for 25 years. It is a diverse collection of creatures who live with us. We have the most variety of any accredited animal sanctuary. We became a home to animals in need in Hawaii. What's up, Nick? So Nick is a lava rescue. Three years ago during the eruption, well, Nick was down in the Leilani area and his whole area, his habitat and his neighborhood had turned into rivers of lava. When I first saw him, he was at the end of a road with a lava river behind him. So we left him food and water and we made a deal with the civil defense. And the head of civil defense, his name was Nick. And we asked him, would you please give him food? So they started feeding Nick plate lunch. And then after he got tame enough, we were able to trick him into a crate and catch him. Within one week, he was laying on his side for me to tickle his tummy. Pigs are so smart, he knew that I was the food fairy and that he could convince me to give him treats. So we started giving him tools to communicate with us, like that bell. In response to the eruption, sanctuaries began to pop up for farmed animals and animals who were displaced. So the places started closing because people didn't realize that running a sanctuary meant seven days a week, that you got up every morning, you did not sleep in, that you did not get to take a day off, that it didn't matter if you really wanted to go out to dinner and you only had X number of dollars, you were going to the feed store instead. So they started closing down and we brought him out here and this was a grassy, beautiful pen and he ate it within a month, ate the whole thing. So giving them enrichment every day is something we do for every single animal here. Behaviors that are non-psychotic, normal, healthy behaviors, foraging, hunting, looking, digging, shredding. That's what a pig would be doing all the time. So we have to think of what we can do to stimulate that kind of behavior. Pretty darn funny what this pig can do. Sit down, please, all the way down and stay. Good pig. Well, there are many disabled animals here. There are some psychologically damaged, some physically damaged, but rescue means that an animal is in a situation of jeopardy. So this is my friend Cody, and Cody came to us when he was nine weeks old, and he needed to be bottle fed, which was a lot of fun, but it was also a little dangerous because Cody didn't recognize that I meant him no harm. And four times a day, for 10 days, he would put his head up in the air and shake and then slam into me. And I wore a helmet, a catcher's vest, shin guards, and I still ended up bruised all over from my jaw to my ankle. You never let down your guard. You're always aware of the creature you're with. You're assertive without being aggressive. You're telling the animal, don't mess with me without saying I'm here to fight. And that's a big, important difference. So he's habituated to us which means that he lets us within his space. It does not make him tame. He's not a pet. This is a buffalo. I weigh 106 pounds. His head is over 200 pounds. He weighs about 1,850 pounds now, and he is fully grown. We go through about 200 pounds of produce every day, and we get our delicious, wonderful, perfect produce from Safeway. And for 20 years now, Safeway has been letting us have this produce that allows us to give these guys incredible diets that we otherwise couldn't do. And there's animals here we would not have accepted for lifetime care if it wasn't for our friends at Safeway. So animals come in as fosters and those animals are not permanent residents. We get them healthy and well and then they can be placed in the community. But if an animal comes in and it's gonna be a resident, lifetime resident, we have to look at where is it going to go on the ranch in a place that isn't going to adversely impact another animal here. Once we're involved, once I learn of the animal in need, we don't abandon it. If we don't take it, I will help get it ready and get it sent to a real accredited sanctuary on the mainland. So this is Patty and her pet pony, Teak. 
The reason the zebra has a pet pony is because zebras do not like to live alone. They stress out, they build up a lot of stomach acid, they get an ulcer, they colic, they die. Teak got to come to us from horseplay, thank you Cindy, where he got to retire. Now little Teak is an old man now, and I'm using my body to protect him from that bossy zebra, because she is definitely pushy. So now Teak is just wanting to come out and go eat. So he's going to head out and go have some grass. Now the zebra doesn't want to go head out and have grass without knowing that the pasture down there is free of lions. So we're going to go free it from lions for her. All right, Patty, let's go look for lions. So what we're doing is we're walking around and we're going to make sure that there's no lions. And Patty will circle around over there and she will emerge to verify that there are no lions. And then Patty will feel comfortable being out here and eating. I was working in Kona as a nurse, as an RN, finishing my PhD when I met Norm. So we got married and then we had a wedding reception party. And in the morning after I was struck in the face by And the lightning strike was across the ravine quite a ways away, but it came down and then turned sideways and came and got me in the face. So I was very lucky that I didn't incinerate. All my muscles constricted. My eyelashes, eyebrows, the hair around my face was all singed off. The burn on the cheek, burn in the mouth. It burnt down through my esophagus, down into my stomach turned my uterus into jello, ruptured my quad, blew my knee apart, and exited the bottom of my left foot. And the thing is, you don't see it from the outside. You see the red cheek, you, you know, on the outside. You look in the mouth, you see the charred area inside of the mouth, but that's all you see. Everything else is inside. So there were multiple surgical procedures and things that I underwent to put me back together. I lost the part of my brain, and it's still gone, that you have that makes you a unique human being. You see, because human beings have a huge amount of your brain energy is spent filtering all the extraneous stuff out, so you focus on speech. That's what we humans do. But an animal doesn't do that. An animal has to be aware of everything in their environment in order to survive. You focus on speech. Have you been annoyed now with the changes in light from the leaf movement? Has the fly been loud to you? Have you been hearing the sound of the cat's tail thumping the table? All of this I'm hearing and seeing. I don't filter that out. If I tell you about it, you can focus on it and you can find it. See, I don't have that filter working anymore, which is why I can't go to Costco. It's too overwhelming. I could think of something, but then I went to write it down and I would have lost the thought while I was staring at my fingers, figuring out how to type a word. I could look in the mirror and see who I was and I knew, looking at a picture, who I used to be. And it was so far apart, I didn't really want to be here anymore. It was so depressing. And Norm, being the nice guy that he is, said, what can I do to help? Now you gotta remember, at this point, expressive aphasia was so strong that when you people would ask me a question they would mostly get gibberish and I looked at him when I said zebra and he said well, okay sure but I meant let's go to Paris <laughs> yeah a few days later he said here's some information about the Molokai Safari Park it closed down here's the lawyers name they're in Oahu um, why don't you talk to them Maybe you can get a zebra from them. And I looked at him like, what are you talking about? Zebra what? And that's how it happened. So his name is Cookie Monster. And then he's got two women with him, Grover and the Donald. So these guys came from Oregon and they get to live here instead of being restaurant food. So they run 46 miles an hour and one kick can disembowel a lion. You know, they're animals. They're not performers, and they get to choose to do what they want. And that's the difference between a sanctuary and a roadside zoo. Literally, this entire place is in trust for them. And this is Sheena. 
So Sheena is an old, old lady. She's a macaque. Macaques are the most successful non-human primate on Earth. They're found in Asia and in India and in Africa. And she doesn't have a purse or a backpack to gather the food in. She has a pouch underneath her chin on the right side. So like a hamster, she's taking all these treats and she's putting them into her pouch. And then she'll go sit somewhere, pop them into her mouth and eat them. So Mr. Pink is the elderly African guy, the small one, and the two Chilean females are from the Hilton Hotel, which we're very lucky to have them here. He was too old to safely fly to the Honolulu Zoo, and their vet actually came over and met Mr. Pink, but the experts in transporting flamingos felt that it was just too high of a risk to move him. And then we got the call from the Hilton that they were gonna retire all their animals, including the flamingos. Now they're in and out of that pool two or three times a day bathing. It really is fun watching them um, come out of their shell and use that whole habitat. Have gotten pinker, healthier, larger. They've gained quite a bit of weight. International volunteers come here from one to three months, and most of them are going into science-based fields. Then the pre-vet program with a special emphasis and extra points given to all of our applicants from Hawaii. And these young people need the hands-on work and the skills developed by doing hands-on work to understand the animal in a way that they're gonna shine when they apply to vet school. And we have 100% success rate at getting our pre-vets into vet school. And then we do uh, second year vet students who come. They've already got their book work under their belt and they're getting ready to start their clinical rotations. So after that second year, they come here during their summer break and do hands-on. So this is the Hands-On Science Center. It's full of all kinds of neat specimens that I've collected over the years and were donated by Fish and Wildlife. It's also our lab inside where we do all kinds of interesting research projects with the kids. They learn how to use a microscope to do uh, specimens, to gram stain things, all kinds of fun stuff. And with the vet students, of course, we're doing a lot more involved. So this is disgusting. It's really hard for me to even put it on just to hold it. This is made by Roberto Cavalli. And this was the height of fashion a couple of years ago. That's it, Belle, fight it. This is an endangered jungle cat coat. It probably was 30 animals to make this coat. Originally sold about $40,000. This is a very fancy shoe, probably a couple thousand dollars, made out of a baby harp seal. Let's really dress up that outfit, those fancy shoes, with an endangered white Cayman bag and throw on your Roberto Cavelli $40,000 endangered jungle cat coat. People actually do this. These animal parts were all seized by fish and wildlife coming into the country illegally. And it's interesting when I do tours, when you have more and more people who will see these things used here in the classroom who end up mailing me things from home. They'll say, you know, I'm not really comfortable having this at home anymore. Can you use it? And they'll send me grandma's coat or different objects, which we can use because the fur, like if they send me a stole, I cut it into blocks and the kids will do studies to see how dense the hair is and think about the animal, where it lives in its environment, why it needs to have a coat that dense. This is Maddie. Maddie's a ring-tailed lemur. And here's her sister, Mo. They're from Hollywood. Celebrity lemurs. Maddie, right here, is very sweet and very gentle. And this one, Mo, over here, she thinks she's the ruler of the world. Lemurs are a matriarchal society, so the girls rule, boys drool. And in her idea, she's the boss. Unfortunately, in reality, I'm the boss. Oh, she's gonna scent mark. Great. Look at this. This is marking. She's got little scent glands here and under her arms, and under her chin, and she just marked. Now, a female lemur's musk is kind of pleasant, but a male lemur can change their musk to smell like an overturned porta potty and they do it at the request of the girl. They'll approach another male lemur, bend their tail, and whiffed it into the face of the other male lemur. This is called stink fighting. It really, really is called stink fighting. Very funny. 
and the girls watch this whole elaborate fighting going on. And amongst them, they figure out who to invite over for the night. Hey, boys. Hi. This little guinea pig habitat allows them to do normal things like a guinea pig would do in the wild. They can dig, they can climb, they can tunnel, and they love it. So George is one of our many sulcata tortoises, and people get these things as pets, but what they don't realize is that if you feed them, they grow. And 375 pounds, they should both weigh about 100 pounds. And that was the hyper growth because they were deliberately overfed that high protein pelleted food. Hi buddy, aren't you a good boy? Sorry, nothing for you today. You already had your salad. So he wanders all over the property grazing on the grasses, which should be 90% of his diet should be grasses and hay. And that's what people don't understand when they get these, is that they're African grazing animals. They graze on harsh conditions, eating weeds and plants and grasses. That's their diet. They're not supposed to be eating fantastic salads and whole papaya and apples and carrots. Ruins them. We are accredited by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries and the ASA, and we were the 2022 Wildlife Sanctuary of the Year award winner for Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Yay! <laughs> Little place, yeah, after out of over 200 nominees, so we were very excited. So volunteers are how we run. Our morning crew comes in at 8, finishes about 11 a.m. They become keepers. They train and learn how to take care of the animals, and they do it in sections, and we need more volunteers. I think of that I am doing a lot with my life, and it's like a bucket of water. My hand is in it, making a lot of waves. But when I die, the water goes still. But if I have hundreds, if not thousands of little hands in that bucket shaking it, when my hand comes out, it's still making waves and going on and on and on. So I don't want the waves to stop. Considering that I was ready to give up and didn't want to be here anymore to the point now where life is a joy, you know, that we've created something so special that's going to go on forever for animals, for students, for young people to learn. That's incredibly lucky. It's not just being hit by lightning, it's what happened after.